In early 2017, we had the opportunity to produce a documentary on the controversial full motion video game Night Trap to go along with its 25th anniversary remaster. The result was a nearly hour long documentary called Night Trap 25 Years Later, which we released here on My Life in Gaming and on Blu-ray Disc through Limited Run Games. In addition, we provided the 25th Anniversary Edition developer, Screaming Villains, with a special feature for the game called A Conversation with James Riley, an edited version of our interview with the original writer, director, and co-creator of Night Trap. We thought Riley's perspective might be considered to be of significant historical value on the development of this famous gaming milestone, so we wanted to release this version online, independent of the game, and in 4K quality, for everyone to enjoy. My name is Jim Riley. And I was uh, co-creator, writer, and director on Night Trap. This is mid '80s. Nintendo is doing very well with their video games, right? Mario Brothers type stuff. Uh, Sega is doing pretty well. I was working with Nolan Bushnell uh, on um, a series of interactive advertising and interactive retailing campaigns. And uh, I got a call from a guy who uh, was actually my neighbor, Rob Fulop who um, were, had developed Demon Attack and a number of Atari games. And he knew of a guy named Tom Zito working at another Nolan Bushnell company that um, had actually uh, been presented. There was a guy, uh, an engineer who came in with this wafer that allowed you to attach it to a VCR and be able to interact with uh, the video cartridge as your video source, but you could interact up to four choices at any one time. And uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. So Rob knew that I had a background in, in live action interactive and introduced me to Tom. Tom wanted to put together some demos to take to Hasbro. And they said, so this is a relatively inexpensive addition to a VCR and if we provide this enhancement, we can actually um, get into the video game business and allow us to compete, that's significant revenue, and now we're in the living room. We all came up with ideas, and my focus was more about these environments where you could go anywhere at any time, or feel as if you could move more freely. One of the easiest ways to think of that is surveillance cameras. The first demo we did was Scene of the Crime to kind of test out, play test the idea of being able to move around through surveillance cameras and see how interesting that was. So in Scene of the Crime, the basic idea is that this wealthy man has a safe full of money in his library and he has this new surveillance system where you, the participant, is the security guy and he tells you to please watch the safe um, and if anybody tries to break in he wants to know about it. Watch them with the cameras. If anyone tries anything I want to know about it. Then you can move around the house, switching cameras, to try to follow what's going on. Of course, everybody has a plot to steal the money. So you're trying to figure out who's involved, how it happens, and then after a three to five minute quick period, sure enough, somebody stole the money, the lights were out, it was hard to tell exactly who it was. You couldn't just sit in the room to figure it out. And then he says, okay, who did it? And then you guess. So really simple concept, but four of us flew back to Hasbro, pitched it to Steven Hasenfeld and a boardroom of 22 executives. That day we got funding, significant funding, to start what became Digital Pictures. Then they said, okay, we want to do a title that uses this. Um, and at that point, I, I was working on a number of other things, but I felt like, Surveillance cameras is great, but to have more 
effect on what happens, rather than just an observer looking at what's going on, if we could create some device that allowed participants to feel more engaged and be able to subtly change the story, again, not branching uh, or changing the ending, but in fact, be able to do something and watch how the story changes. And have to play it multiple times to really understand the subtleties of that. And that was the traps, which could be done even within this very limited environment. What happened, though, was you know everybody started to realize, wow, this is tricky stuff. Part of it is that there was never a real formula. Hasbro decided that it didn't want to move forward. They began, I think, to understand that this is a significant investment. This is like starting a studio. We all went away, 1989, and then in 1992, Tom negotiated a deal with Sega, who had come up with the Sega CD, which was just powerful enough <laughs> to stream. Back then, it's Donkey Kong, it's um, Mario Brothers, you know, really simple pixelated graphics. And so all of a sudden, there was this option to play or experience a live action interactive world that was all photoreal with real people, et cetera. So that, that I think was the initial excitement. And so when the Sega CD came out, you know, everybody was just hats and horns and this is fantastic and look, we can interact with this. And we had a, a number of really interesting people that were experimenting, is really the best way to say it, with this sort of new platform. Not quite sure what it was. And everything from writers who were you know, I, I, having constructive arguments about interactive narrative, which is very tricky, right? A lot of people will say, we don't want people to look the wrong way or be doing, we want to control their experience. And, and um, to give this to novice or non-filmmakers, it, it goes against everything that they've been trained to do. The other side of that is the game, is a video game. And a video game, a really good video game, is you have full control. You're actually, uh, the world is very believable, the full of fascinating characters, and you're motivated to do a number of things to achieve whatever the goal is. Uh, but it's a high level of interactivity, right? And you're, um, that's more important than the believability of your environment, right? So those are the two extremes. Even back then, those were the two extremes. But there was this funny gray area, and nobody quite knew what to make of it. You know, we called it FMV or Live Action Interactive or whatever those things were. We'd bring in a writer, a director, a game designer, a software programmer, there were all these different people sitting around a table speaking completely different languages, having very different sensibilities, trying to find some common ground. The first concept was to take the sort of wealthy guy and, you know, with a safe full of money to the extreme. So it was a billionaire who had, you know, Fort Knox in his house modern house in Lake Tahoe. He was able to do this with comfort and leave knowing that he had this next generation security system, which included the latest surveillance cameras and also this, um, these traps and gadgets that would allow any, um, would allow the 24 seven security team to be able to trap any potential intruders. And so happens one weekend, his daughter shows up for a slumber party with all of her teenage friends, and the house is attacked by ninja burglars. And the reason I thought ninjas would be the cool approach would be that they move in the shadows. You start off with this really simple, clean concept that, you know, could be refined and and um, really have an edge to it and a look and stuff. And you end up with this thing that um, is, a, is a combination of bad notes over time. And somehow it went from ninjas 
focused on getting the money, you know, and the girls being able to, you know, they were sort of um, not the key, but they were very much caught in the mix to vampires. There was this thing called reproducible violence. It's the first time I had heard that term, um, but it turns out to be a, a very real thing. And Hasbro in particular was very concerned about that. So we went into kind of the supernatural realm with the vampire. And they said, no, 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 we don't want to see you know, vampires biting the girls. So these were toothless um, vampires, and they could not move too quickly. So they actually had to be kind of sick. So they had to be toothless, sick vampires. <laughs> I mean, it just kept getting worse. And the og term came because they really needed blood, and the only way they could get it was to auger in with a device like the trocar. That cleared as a non-reproducible <laughs> violence. I thought that in our effort to homogenize this thing and make it um, more friendly and less scary, it, it actually was pretty creepy in terms of these you know, strange characters walking around with the trocar. In this case, the script writing was so bizarre because you had to do two things. You, you had to create a world, then you had to navigate within that world. You had technical limits of what you could actually do, but you were cheating that to make it look like you could do anything. So that was a whole thing. And then for the moments, you could write a scene, but the scene had to motivate somebody to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But the script was not 120 pages. The script was like this, right, with a timeline. There. And people were going, how do I read this? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm OK, I'm here and what. Because everything was, by the way, time, right? Because you only had that much time for the scene. So blocking was very different, um, you know, rather than sitting down with the actors and saying, you know, What's, what's the uh, intent here? And you know, should you walk over here? And you know, where should you? It was like, OK, we got, we got, you have 24 seconds. So how do we block this where you're going to end up going out that door, but it's got to look natural, right? Yeah. And you got you to gotta be out that door in 18 seconds, because in 18 seconds, you're going to appear in the hallway. I walked around with a timeline. I, I think it became sort of a joke, which is, you know, where are we now? And I'd have to take the timeline out. And it would, had eight tracks, right? Four at any one time with stills. And, um, and I would be able to figure out. So it, it was tricky. Uh, that we shot days and nights, um, you know, sets and locations. I was surprised at how quickly everybody got into it. Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't difficult for them to go, oh, I get it, okay, so you know, I'm going to be here, but I could be over there, and then depending on what happens with the AUG here, I might, and they got into it. And, and in some cases, they adjusted their performance accordingly, which was a, a wonderful surprise. We didn't have a lot of money to cast name talent and that sort of thing. Dana Plato was um, someone who we were lucky to, to get. Well, there's something about Kelly. Hmm, woman's intuition again, huh? huh. Oh, Victor, you monster. <laughs> Come on, let's go. We don't want to upset the augers. All the augs were stunt guys with you know, trash bags taped to them. But they, when the trap went, they had to be in a position where they were balanced, right? Because when they drop through the floor, they've got to be able to do it. How do you move? You do this. So that became the og walk. We had to figure out um, in the shooting how to be most economical. So we generally shot out each environment. The bedroom was the first, one of the first sets we shot. And the lobby, uh, or the foyer, was one of the last. But most of the continuity, there were so many other issues that Continuity like that was the least of anybody's concern. This guy is really weaked out. <laughs> Trying to create an environment where the cast, and to some degree the DP and the lighting guys, really could participate as if they were making a, 
a movie. There were other technical restrictions. They, they were very um, nervous about things that were too dark. I mean, the way it was originally envisioned was that it was um, really cool and edgy. And it turned out to be super bright because they were concerned that if it got too dark, that it would pixelate too much. Because the technology was so new and we were right at the edge. What was interesting is we shot Night Trap on 35 millimeter. In fact, Don Burgess was the DP and you know went on to do Forrest Gump and not that Night Trap launched his <laughs> career. I mean, Don Burgess, this brilliant DP, is having to essentially light the room like everything's got neon lights. And we were all um, unhappy about that. But at the same time, it's the first time it's being done, mm -hmm. right? And there were a lot of people involved, and everybody was making their best guess. The shoot was tricky. Um, we shot days and nights, um, you know, sets and locations. The post was very tricky. Uh, I ended up using, I think it was Ediflex at, at one pass. It was the only way to cut this, because what you end up with, it's a puzzle. Right? So think of it as you know, a 3D chess game where you're trying to figure out, okay, I got a little piece right there and I got a piece that ties into that. In spite of all of this, it was a title that became very popular with a lot of people, I think primarily because it was one of the first to have real characters you know, in a real photo, real world. Sarah, we're in this huge house with all your friends. We have telephones, we have a car, your parents are gone, and you say so? Come on, Sarah, what's the first thing you think of? Party! We had gone through a three-year period with Hasbro where we looked at the marketplace, we did a ton of play testing, and I don't think it was ever clearly resolved what this thing was. And in fact, when it was ported over Sega CD, I felt more concerned. Yes, it was being released, but it was being released on a game platform. And, and sure enough, you know, everybody was going, well, this isn't really a game. I mean, this is an interesting thing, and it's fun. And, and for a lot of pe people, they didn't need a heavy interaction. So the live action, real characters was more interesting, at least for a period of time. Night Trap goes out and still a new market, nobody quite knows what's going on and I don't think the sales were that great. And then all of a sudden there's a Senate hearing on violence in video games and Night Trap is one of the premier, and I'm just thinking, you're kidding. I mean because by that time we had homogenized it down to the simplest things. The only thing that was probably the most um, Violent was the troll car in the bathroom scene. Megan, this isn't gonna work. You're not scaring me. Wait, what are you doing now? If you saw the Senate hearing, what it looked like is somebody had just edited out the most violent things from different games, including Night Trap, and put it together and showed it to these guys who, of course, most likely never played video games, so they didn't really understand the market. But what they thought is, my eight-year-old kid is being trained to kill people. If you talk to the kid, he'd go, what are you talking about? This is like, a, you know, not a big deal. So I think what happened is there were selects that were made, including the trocar scene in the bathroom of Night Trap. They said, not only is this violence, not only are you promoting violence to our kids and somehow subconsciously turning them into, you know, violent criminals, but because it's real, it's actually more scary. Up till that time, it was pixelated graphics. And when it became real, I think everybody thought, oh my God, now, now this is really bad. I don't think there was a lot of understanding of what was going on in the business. I don't think that Night Trap, in comparison to some of the other games that were out at that time, um, was that violent. Um, it did have its moments, and when you, just like anything, once you take those things and you put them together, you can make anything look like the worst horror film you've ever seen. But thank God, 
because two things happened. One is sales of Nitrap just went through the roof, um, and then they came up with the rating system. The irony is that Nitrap is still on the list of most violent games. I, you know, and, and you look at what's out there, I, I mean, th there's no comparison. You know, the shower scene, it's not even a shower scene, but the bathroom scene uh, with a troke car, it, it, it looks pretty gruesome when you do the close up and you mm -hmm. see the drill going into the neck, and I get, I get that. Uh, at least back then it was you know, considered to be pretty gruesome. But, it, you know, for some people, you, you have to look at the Augs as kind of sad. <laughs> What's happening now is it's worth bringing back Night Trap and some other things just because it, you know, there are a lot of people that would love to see it in, yeah. in better resolution and I don't know where the film is. I mean, fortunately, I made a copy of the original timed masters and those um, were, again, timed for this unknown world. So everything's bright and but even then, um, you're going to see a lot more contrast and a lot more detail than you did through the Sega CD. I'm hoping that the fans of the game will actually have a, um, a newer, fresher experience with the resolution change. I'm also very interested in people that have never been in this world before and don't think of it as a game and don't think of it as a movie, but think of it as live action interactives. Today, you say interactive and it's like, yeah, yeah, so what? You know, what specifically do you mean? Your computer's interactive, right? So back then, it was a, people didn't understand when you said interactive. They really didn't know what that meant. Uh, or they'd have very different ideas about what that meant. Um, so in some ways, that part of it, uh, I think it's going to be fun.